cloud. Hi everyone, welcome to Fission's Thursday Tech Talk. Uh, today we're gonna have Brooke. Uh, Brooke, can you give us a wave? Um, uh, Fission co-founder and CTO, talk us through what we're doing with our roadmap plans around shared private files uh, connected to our web native file system. So take it away, Brooke. Awesome, thanks. Yeah, so this is gonna be a bit of a shorter one. A bit of the backstory was, Last week, two weeks ago, something it was like, yeah, could you, you know, say say a couple of words about um, thinking on uh, private shared files? Um, and so I threw a couple of slides together, and then we ran out of time. So uh, we figured we should probably actually give it. Um, so can everybody see the um, keynote? Yeah, great, fantastic. So um, yeah private shared files, but of course that means we need to know a little bit about the file system uh, itself. So this is gonna be review from previous talks, just you know, cut down only to the bits that we care about. Um, so this is our full stack. Uh, this has been in pretty much every presentation we've given. Um, and we're essentially working, you know, top down and bottom up uh, on this. So uh, the actual platform abstractions are supported by everything below that line. Um, and uh, obviously we've done you know, identity and um, uh, you know, the uh, private files and, and read all of this stuff. Um, and we're gonna be focusing really on um, this section here, which is supported by uh, the things that are still um, not, not uh, faded out. Uh, the other thing to be uh, aware of is that um, files are kept with the user, not with a particular app, right? So if we have a couple users, Alice, Bob, and Carol, um, you know, Bob can have his photo gallery data, you know, in the app and only in his file system. But there's lots of use cases where we're going to want to share assets across users um, or across many users, right? Um, and parts of this is facilitated by having hard and soft links. So in the same way that uh, a Unix file system has uh, both of its concepts, so uh, sim links and, and uh, actual hard links, uh, we have this, the same concept. So hard links, uh, this is something new for the web. Uh, this is essentially putting a file inside of the, the Merkle tree. Uh, so it is always available and you have a direct reference to it and it's essentially a copy of that file um, at its current state and doesn't update over time, right? It's like this specific thing. Um, soft links uh, are uh, done by name and reference by a path. And so you can then, it's much more like a URL where you can say, well, the thing over there, whatever the latest version of it is. Brooke, hmm? uh, just, just a quick pause or to expl expository uh, piece here. So. Um, new for the web, recall uh, that we're building on top of IPFS, the interplanetary file system, which uses content addressing. Um, and so with content addressing, it means that there is one universal uh, address that is location independent that just references a particular piece of content. So um, if I put boris.jpg on IPFS, I get a hash, a content address that is unique to the contents of that file. Um, if you download it and put like a funny clown nose on me and upload it again, still named boris.jpg, it'll get a different address because the bits inside of it are, are different. Um, um, so interesting aspects there for both versioning and kind of authenticity, essentially. You can guarantee that like, no, no, this is the version that I uploaded and once it's up, there, there's no faking uh, because you literally can't edit um, uh, anything about it. Like even things like if you upload an image where you might change like the EXIF data that says information about the image, that would result in a different hash. So it has some interesting side effects here uh, around this as well, where we've been used to linking to example.com slash boris.jpg. You're not even guaranteed that that's a JPEG file. It may be a PHP file that infects your computer. So interesting stuff. Um, yeah, so it's, I mean, 
basically bringing both of these styles in, into a single system, right? Uh, so you can obviously link, uh, so these file systems are a graph, not just a tree, um, but often uh, having links to the same file, hard links, um, means that uh, you're not going to be able to update to the latest version of that. So typically you wanna have a canonical hard link uh, and then a, um, uh, a sim link within a file system say, well, go look at the latest version over there. The downside for a, a sim link is that it can potentially break because it's just a path. Something might not be there. Hard links cannot break. It's not possible, right? Um, and then obviously you can't have hard links between file systems because they're separate structures. So you can uh, sim link between those. The uh, layout, um, so this is kind of mixing between levels of the conceptual layout and the actual, um, you know, protocol level uh, layout in the, in the file system. You have a top reference, so in this case, alice.vision.name, a public side, which is a fully exposed tree. There's a, a, some detail that I'm glossing over here just for the, the purposes of this talk. And then the private side, uh, which contains both user files and then these sharing um, bits that, that we'll be talking about in a moment. The private nodes uh, are still one of these trees, but each layer is encrypted um, with an AES key um, and then given keys for all of its children. So each file um, and each directory has its own key and each directory contains the keys for its direct children and then you know, recursively you can get. Uh, so if you have access to, in fact, that's the next slide. If you have access to say this uh, orange section, you have access to everything below that, including the red bits. Uh, but if you only have the red section, you don't see orange or the black, right? And when you say don't see, part of this design really is as well so that um, uh, you don't leak other parts of the, the file system to if you don't have access to it. Yes, yeah. So it, this is the same uh, model as uh, you know systems like uh, Dropbox or Google Drive or, or any of those where if you have access to you know this directory, you can see everything below it, but you have no idea about anything else in the system. We've gone and uh, spent uh, time hiding a bunch of the metadata. It's hard to correlate files unless you have a key, an entry point, and then you can begin to discover the structure uh, inside. So again, I'm glossing over massive parts because otherwise this would be a four hour talk. Um, and yeah, so it, it scrambles the structure. So everything sits in a, um, gets encrypted, it gets a special naming convention uh, that is entirely based on the keys. So it has nothing to do at all with the uh, user file name. Um, scrambled, placed in this, uh, uh, tree structure that's really um, like a, a particular kind of prefix tree, um, which gives us really good access, uh, arbitrary access inside. Um, and then as you're discovering the structure of the tree, so you're given an entry point, which is just one random node. Uh, it also includes links to the other nodes in this tree. And so you can then start to build up a materialized view uh, of a decrypted uh, file system. So really the question becomes, how do we get you that entry point, right? So- uh, Brooke, the, uh, <laughs> there's just asking a particular kind of prefix tree. I think that's a champ, right? This is a champ, yeah. Which stands for? I don't even remember. Um, <laughs> it's a hash, uh, it's a kind of hash prefix tree. Uh, so uh, all, all of the stuff is, uh, is or will be in the white paper. Um, and uh, uh, we, we keep iterating over what this is. I think we, it used to be um, a Merkelized Patricia tree, but then we realized that this was more efficient. Uh, yeah, so um, this is still technical. Uh, the, the major difference between this and a, uh, modified Merkle Patricia tree is, uh, this isn't laid out in a content addressed form. This is still named, but the naming scheme is based on the keys. And that's, uh, has to do with, uh, ah. right access permissions, uh, zero knowledge, right access permission. 
Um, but that's that's an entire you can talk. So uh, essentially, you can give uh, this is on the, the the white paper. You can give access to write to any subset of the tree uh, where the validator doesn't know anything about the contents or what's related other than um, a bit mask uh, to match against these names. And that's that's it. Um, and happy to talk about all of that stuff like separately. It's just, it doesn't actually affect this specific topic. So it's just kind of like, this is the layout. This is rough, roughly how these things work. So uh, we need to have some way of uh, giving you an entry point, a key, et cetera, when non-interactively, when somebody's not online. Right? Um, so you could do that out of band. You could send somebody an email. Right, but what if I want to just show up and discover um, that I have access to some files, or um, maybe uh, we have a um, you know a group um, directory, and uh, somebody new joins the team, and we want to share you know many different resources with them. Well, they shouldn't have to go through and click a bunch of things. They should just show up and be able to follow links to stuff and have it work. Right. So we're focusing on just this section. Uh, of the file system here, shared by me and shared with me. So yeah, the, the problem really is uh, sharing credentials while you're online. We already do this. This is account linking. Uh, essentially works the same way, right? You, you open a peer-to-peer uh, -peer or a WebSocket connection or something. You do key exchange, create a secure session, and start sending stuff back and forth. Right. Um, but when the recipient is offline uh, during that time, uh, well, you can't do this interactively anymore. Right. Uh, so you could hand the keys to a server to, to mediate in between or some some central authority. Um, you could use a password. Right. Um, problem with passwords. They're not very secure. They're very clunky. Um, they're brute forceable. Right. Like all all of these things. Um, and you have to still transmit them out of band. You have to agree somehow on uh, some shared secret, right? So it would be better if we didn't have to do that. So we're using key exchange, probably not that surprising. Um, classic Diffie-Hellman key exchange, super battle tested, been around for decades. Um, we're standardizing on 2048-bit RSA keys. Um, mainly because those are available just everywhere, uh, including in the Web Crypto API. Um, we do have elliptic curves in various parts of the system, but not all browsers support them, not all systems support them. We in no way want to expose the private key in a uh, readable form. So everything has to be in the on the browser side um, in the Web Crypto API with a non-exportable key. So this is the uh, most portable way of doing that, even though these keys are enormous and slow, though not slow in uh, on human time scales, slow on computer time scales, right? Inside uh, of that. Hmm? Just for reference again, um, coloring in some things, the Web Crypto API is a modern browser API. Um, so we're tying into that. It's available on, on you know, if you look at caniuse.com, it's available on all modern browsers, including mobile browsers. And that's always our line in the sand of when can we adopt something. The variability on some of this stuff, when Brooke says, you know, stuff that's available everywhere, is the spec requires implementation of certain different key types. Um, and then we had to pick one um, that was available el elsewhere. There were some other keys that we would have liked to have used. Um, but I think it ends up being WebKit that doesn't implement and Firefox, I think as well, uh, that don't implement some of the curves that we'd, we'd prefer to use. Yeah, um, so th th there's a whole sidebar here about the, the NIST curves, which are also not available in every browser, but uh, maybe being uh, slightly cooked, which is not great. We'll, just, we'll, we'll leave that there. <laughs> yeah, um, even though they're much smaller, much faster, et cetera, like would be convenient, but um, yeah, uh, probably not safe to use. So we're, we're going with the, um, the very well understood one. And this is not the main use case for everything in the system, right? So it's, it's really a couple of places where we need to use these, um, 
large slower keys, right? Uh, inside of there uh, is a 256-bit AES key. So this, um, this whole kind of setup is a kind of authenticated key exchange or AIC. Um, so we're doing, uh, putting a symmetric key inside of a asymmetric um, uh, exchange wrapper, right? So you only need to know the um, public key of the person that you're sending to. And we have that all listed directly on the file system. Right. Um, each device needs its own non-exportable keys. Um, so every browser, every CLI, et cetera, needs to have its own set. Um, and this key cannot be reused for signing, for crypto reasons, basically. Uh, it must be only an exchange key. Okay. Um, so you end up with two sets of keys. You have an exchange key and then a signing key, right? Where the signing key is not used for this, this specific use case. Um, so yeah, the actual files that you wanna send, which are then encrypted in AES, and then that key is encrypted with uh, RSA. So the file sharing uh, itself, uh, so you'll have a, uh, for each of your uh, recipient keys, these exchange keys, um, Brooke, Brooke uh, there's just uh, uh, some questions here that I want to make sure that I mm -hmm. answer. Um, uh, Jury or, or David, do you want to? Can you? Uh, uh, do you want to explain what you're trying to ask? I don't know if we were asking the same thing. Gary is still muted. Um, you you gotta get the public key from somewhere, right? So it's still an out of band exchange that has to happen somewhere, or is that? It's right available? on the file system. How so it's listed right on the, the file yeah system. yeah you mentioned that I was like so how does it look oh uh, so if you have access to the file system at all in the public side you can list here's the keys you can find me at is there an API call okay. for it or uh, what's the API uh, you could get it over HTTP or IPFS it's it's so the the files that you're going to be trying to access it's on the same same data structure it, yes, it lives so. in the same place. So I think the question is, uh, cool, using web native, is yes. there an API call to yes. get the public key? Oh, uh, yes, yes. Or there, there will be one, well, this, this is all hypothetical, just to be clear, okay. this, okay. Is, this okay. is not implemented. Okay. Yeah. No, I just, I just saw that, I, I thought that it was already available because obviously you already have some keys in the system, public keys. So I thought that would be possible by now already, but okay, that's fine. Yeah, so you, you can get the signing key, like the identity key today. Uh, and in fact, we, we have um, an existing implementation of parts of this in DNS, but we are uh, continually moving things onto, um, uh, right onto the file system because it just makes sense to keep everything together, right? That's all right, that's all right, that's fine. I mean, I would just, uh, yeah, that's fine, thank you. Yeah, and I think, I think, I guess, Brooke, just to touch on that. So technically today we are keeping the DID for a particular user um, mm -hmm. is available via, via uh, DNS. It is, yes. Yeah. So we're using the uh, DNS, um, it's a underscore DID, it's a standard um, where you keep the uh, public key for the signing key of the root user, right? So this is all detail that ends up getting taken care of by web native basically that, that you don't need to handle directly. Uh, that key, the private portion of that can go missing and actually everything continues to work. So it's, it's mainly to be used as a global identifier more than anything else, and then attached into uh, the UCAN signing chain. Um, so as long as you have a valid chain going back to that key, everything's fine, but it actually doesn't need to stick around technically. Uh, bottom line, uh, I took some notes. I'll make sure we document that. Um, you know, that's the interesting thing is we don't keep this stuff in a private fission database. Um, we, we put it in DNS so that other systems uh, can look at it at a well-known location. Uh, I've been looking at this specifically with well-known for things like Webfinger um, to do federation and so on, right? So we, we keep a namespaced username for every fission account but underneath the unique and portable identifier, 
um, is a DID, which is in fact a public key. Yeah. Cool. Uh, so Paul Sharon, yeah. So you take the addresses that this can be accessed at, you know, the, the recipient keys. Um, you then create one of these, um, oh, lost focus, there we go, okay. Um, a node in the private file system uh, that contains uh, that structure that we just looked at the last slide where, you know, RSA, AES, and then the, um, uh, the pointer to the thing that you're going to be looking for, right? So it contains a key and a symlink, which is this box on the left here, right? Um, and then you'll be able to take that, decrypt it with your uh, private key. Uh, you now have access to a symmetric key and a pointer to another node uh, in the private system. And now you have an entry point and you can start to discover a structure. Um, so yes, how to broadcast the public keys? Hey, this was one of the questions a second ago. Um, so we're using the file system itself. It's basically like a well-known, which of course just mentioned, um, because public keys are public, right? You can put them anywhere um, that you want. Um, and we're able to do discovery by name, right? So you can look up the username. That'll give you um, the root key, which then lets you look up the share keys, which uh, then lets you do this. Um, uh, using those, you can do the exchange. Um, this is a uh, Zucco's triangle. Uh, it says your uh, identifiers can be human, me human meaningful, decentralized, or secure. You know, pick, pick two of three. Uh, so we've really um, optimized for secure, and then we have some mix of uh, decentralized and human meaningful because there is this DNS portion, which is distributed but still controlled by a single party, right? So it's somewhere uh, between those two um, balanced and then, but still highly secure because the uh, 2048 bit keys. Um, yeah, uh, all of these end up stored in the same tree as all the private files. So it has all the same security properties uh, as that. Um, there's, um, Index name is different, space is huge. Yeah, I mean, oh, right, yeah. So uh, this doesn't have to live in the private file system, as in the root of the file system doesn't have to be, um, there doesn't need to be a path down so that if you share the root, they can see all of what everybody else has shared, right? You can actually live in a separate, again, in this materialized view, when it's gone from those you know red nodes into a green, you, we can actually store multiple trees in there because we tear down the structure and, and store it in this, uh, in this tree uh, at the end. So it doesn't have to be um, uh, in the file system, right? It's actually a separate structure, even though it's at the storage layer, at the protocol layer, it's uh, in, in the single tree. Uh, we're not worried at all um, about uh, running out of names or having a namespace collision because it's just, the space is massive in there. Um, this is what the name uh, scheme looks like, right? So sender exchange key, recipient exchange key. Uh, so you do end up with, ha uh, you have to share uh, N times M uh, keys. Um, but uh, the number of devices tends to be small. And even if it's not, uh, the actual sharing, um, so the it's doing the writes that you have to come up with this many. Uh, on the read side, uh, you only have to check for as many as the, uh, sorry, you only have to check your key because you know the sender and your key, right? Um, and that's the, yeah, that's the same time complexity I just uh, said. So, uh, you know, this is uh, low single digit uh, keys from both parties typically. Um, it's done infrequently, and uh, again, it's fast on human time scales. Uh, even though uh, on machine scales, this is uh, because RSA uh, fairly heavyweight. Uh, so the actual lookup. So we think of trees this way, but I'm going to rotate it like this for um, just to fit everything on the slide. Uh, this is the user entry. Um, which is the shared bit. This gives you the uh, entry point into the file system. 
and then you can start um, grabbing uh, uh, more nodes as you as you go down and you start discovering the structure, right? Um, and uh, yeah, you can have multiple entry points within within these shared, right? So like it's uh, they can be completely separate um, uh, uh, parts of the file system. It doesn't have to be here's a single root, and then this is what that person gets. You can share them multiple different pieces, and then have them share different parts of the tree. So I only want to share my photos and my I don't know my music folder, but not my documents, right? Um, so you can you can do do those kinds of schemes, um, and again uh, the naming convention on the uh, on the entry point names. Um, so you need to keep this around. Um, oh, sorry, right. Uh, the bit here on set version um, is as the file gets updated, um, the naming convention stays the same. And you're always able to say, well, give me version 10 or 20 or 50 or 100, right? Uh, so you're always able to, assuming that there's been no key rotation, so there's been no revocation that's happened, you're always able to hop to the latest version of the file. You don't have to get it shared again when somebody updates something. Part of the system for the private tree is that it is done by name. And it's this totally deterministic uh, naming scheme. So if you have the key, you're able to find the latest version of the file. Always. Um, you then need to uh, copy. Uh, you could just use it as is, but there's nothing guaranteeing you that this um, file system won't go away or they won't overwrite this, um, you know, do a, a force push and completely change the file system, which is not the main use case, but like totally happen. So you need to copy this key into your file system if you want that to stick around. Uh, and it goes into your shared file system or shared into your private file system, just like um, uh, just like the sender has it there. So, so this is the receiver. So this is the sender's system. They produce this key, which then you read off of their file system and then uh, store it in yours. Right, and now you don't always have to go out to theirs. You probably have a cache locally as well. And so this is uh, effectively uh, like um, an Apple keychain, is how we're thinking about this segment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, basically. So there's uh, there's some other stuff that we're doing with keys that are um, that are interesting for other. Use cases, but yeah, we we we've really started to settle on this uh, keychain concept, where um, you know here's shared files um, and all the keys you need for that, but also you know maybe we're going to be storing you know parts of VLS keys and stuff like that for other use cases uh, as well. So there's a lot of use case uh, around key management here. So um, all of this detail. Um, uh, and set up so that we can get async sharing, security, keep it performant, uh, automated discovery of new files uh, or new versions of files, um, fully key-based, so no, not password, um, and um, uh, to do this all autonomously. Right? Uh, and builds on the existing implementation. So there's um, actually at the, storage layer, there's very little for us to do. It's mainly uh, actually going and implementing the like, okay, well, I'm gonna have to look something up. And, you know, so it builds on top of the existing uh, system entirely. Um, uh, yeah, so all that really needs to happen is um, moving the exchange keys. I mean, technically they can live in DNS, but moving those onto the file system and um, the actual uh, you know, look up of the key based on address uh, or on address based on public key um, and storage of that key uh, in, in your file system. So it actually ends up being fa fairly lightweight to, uh, to implement relative to the other things we've been doing, right? Can you, can uh, you actually, uh, uh, 
I mean, we can give you, if, if that's it, let's give you, uh, let's that's give you some it. jazz hands. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, I'll jump in with a, with a question. So uh, anonymous link-based sharing. Uh, can you talk about uh, what that is? So th this is essentially, recall everyone, this is available in, in web native. You have an account, you've got single user, you can read other people's public files, again, by discovery of, of their username their public files that are at a well-known location. So you can share files like that. And, um, but you can't write to other people's private file system, uh, public file system. So this is shared rewrite of things that are private between in people. Um, what is anonymous link-based sharing? Okay, yeah. So um, you can do sharing two ways. One, you could literally post like, uh, because it's all uh, exchange key, based. Uh, somebody could brute force their way through every file system, but you could post a link and say, hey, here's the link to the thing, and only the recipient can use it, so A. Um, and the only way that they would know who it's even for is if um, they knew both the sender and the receiver's keys. So it's the only way to know who it's for is to already know who it's for, right? Um, the other thing you can do with this is uh, do away with the um, RSA layer entirely um, and start doing out of band um, communication. So this doesn't uh, completely get rid of or uh, preclude the ability to do, you know, send by an email and then have, you know, a query param that includes the private, uh, the, um, the symmetric key on it. Totally could do that uh, with the security trade-off that, that comes with. But if I wanted to send a file to somebody who didn't have uh, a web native account, then or a Fission account, then um, it's still doable, right? Right. So this is the general use case of uh, Dropbox or G Drive or whatever, yeah. where you're you're saying you know anyone can view uh, and doing that on a per file base or per directory base. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. And with read only permission read only permissions yeah yeah uh yeah ultimately um if you want to give uh, uh some other permissions people are going to have to have an account so that they can do things right so yeah. that, that's how things work um other questions uh yeah um key rotation basically means you could revoke access for somebody right mm -hmm. but then yeah. Then they basically still have access to potentially previous versions, like just like you would in Dropbox, like you might have downloaded the stuff from before. Yeah, exactly. So uh, th this actually ends up uh, working really nicely with the rotation use case because you rotate the key, you want to get rid of somebody, but you want to leave everybody else there. Well, now you need to reshare the new key, right? So if we have automatic discovery of keys, the next person, time somebody comes in, they're like, oh, I can't read that thing. Is there a new key? Yes, okay, cool. And they can keep going. So, so this is roughly again, kind of how things work today. Um, you know, depending if you're on and offline centralized systems, et cetera, where you've got a shared folder in Dropbox, you know, if you actually have the files on disk and you don't reconnect to Dropbox, we can't yank those from your system. In fact, they're not encrypted. They're sitting on your file system in your operating system. Um, if you do go online, uh, then they'll get yanked <laughs> uh, sort of thing, but the, we can't like, we can't prevent the bits from not being out there, but the people don't have access going forward. Uh, yeah, exactly. So in, uh, it is possible. So as much as, as much as we can, we want the system to be uh, immutable and have, you know, versions and, you know, all, all of the nice things that make this convenient. Um, but, you know, there's definitely cases where somebody will post something that they shouldn't have and will need to overwrite history. To totally doable, right? So there, there is that case that we have to think about. Peter. Uh, Peter. Yeah, so um, one of the things that I've worried about a lot with this stuff is uh, you know if I share some a link with someone on Dropbox and then I change my mind, mm -hmm. like I have technically they may have grabbed it and taken it, but practically if I do this quickly there is a very small window, and this kind of like time box 
disclosure is mm -hmm. like uh, often is seen more commonly these days in the security community with like SPAC implementations and things like that. And mm -hmm. you know, with the auto merge, hyper merge design, specifically like DAT IPFS, well, if you accidentally disclose a key, you're snookered. There's no way to revoke that. Is there any consideration in the system now to like, oh, it turns out I don't want to work with this accountant anymore. I'm going to revoke access. And if they hadn't downloaded these files, they no longer have access to them. Or is that kind of out of scope for the current design? Yeah, so you can uh, remove the, if, if I'm understanding the, the question correctly, you can remove the shared, um, the, the key exchange, the, the Dippy yeah. Hellman. Uh, yeah, portion. so they're gonna they're gonna get the link, but it won't work when they click it because you've revoked. Correct. Yeah, yeah. So if they haven't looked at it at all yet, that's the easy case of the the share is just not available anymore. It's just gone. Yeah. Which again is same as uh, I I think the scenario that you said about uh, the the oops of 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 deleting the Dropbox share. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. They're they're like mechanically related. Yeah. Totally. And the other thing is, have you looked at any of the group protocols? Just to, I mean, I know you have this automated key discovery, but one of the things mm. we've been spending a bunch of cycles on trying to understand mm. better is the opportunity for these sort of like evolving group membership, like automatic key distribution uh, at the like group level rather than uh, sort of further down, like building the group in as like a primitive of the system, or is that still kind of like? Well, yeah, not, so that's or not necessary with your architecture. Uh, so we've thought about it a little bit. Um, at some point, you still need to share um, a entry point into the group, right? Mm -hmm. So it still ends up from the like the high level. You still end up needing to do this kind of a share, but then inside of that uh, uh, group um, directory. Right, and I mean more in like phone book directory sense, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, or or index, uh, you have keys to all and keys and pointers to other uh, things, which may or may not be on the um, uh, on the same file system, right? So it's like we can have links and keys really to any uh, anything. Um, doing uh, revocation there is. Uh, trickier because now you have to keep track of here's the different things I'm going to revoke, right? Um, but we thought about it a little bit. It's not something that we've, um, uh, that we're baking in, in some like major use case way uh, up front, but it's definitely uh, the, well, what if I want to work on this collaboratively with a bunch of other people in the company um, is something that we, we do think about from time to time, yeah. Yeah, so I, I think generally Peter, like, at some layer, um, baking in organizations or groups yeah. makes total sense. Um, and exactly what, uh, how those are easily discoverable and a few other things like that, including um, that we, you know, whether or not you leak the names of the groups or not, or if they're meant for public consumption, right? Like um, you could build Facebook like systems with some of this stuff or you could build stuff that looks like GitHub with it and you or and, and Twitter lists for so for some of these things you don't really necessarily want um, you know a group where the label that is people that I don't like <laughs> yeah Twitter has this problem with, with lists. is visible yeah uh, <laughs> yeah I mean this is something we're we're spooling up a project on at the lab right now on that side of things unrelated to the work you're doing here but um, we're looking at whether we can sort of invert the idea of identity so you don't have a central registry everybody looks people up in, but that you can establish trust without uh, and I, sort of the socio-technical mechanisms for that. Yeah, th there's even a thing of like that. So, uh, you know, underneath there's this whole decentralized identifiers piece that that is there. Um, I am still thinking about, and, and Brooke mentioned well-known, um, I did a quick experiment actually, and I, and I think there's some interesting things around verified credentials that pattern yeah. of even just being like are you allowed to see the name of this group of people you can ask for it and know that in this context uh we we verify that this is the name for this group 
Um, so we have some building blocks here, but you're absolutely right. I think a lot of the social technical things are exactly the part that are, that so, are like, we need to get yeah. there. The, the provocation from Kay Deem at the New Design Congress, who if you haven't talked to, you should be following his work. He basically argues that a lot of the problems with our centralized systems are that these central registries of names and images where other people define the names for you are what expose us to phishing attacks and other kinds of things. And so his take is that rather than having one registry where other people offer you their names, people introduce themselves to you and then you give them a name. This is a little bit like the known hosts file in an SFH uh, key pairs system where you connect to a system, it offers you some random string of bytes. And then you're like, yeah, cool. I've seen this string of bytes before, but without it, I wouldn't be able to demonstrate that. I think this is, it's not quite, it's but it's not almost terrible. The, it's the inverse also of saying, hey, I have a well-known and these are the, the labels that I'm, that I'm okay publicly associating with myself, which you can feel free to use as a hint. So I'm not a hash when I show up. Yeah, and it's tricky, right? And, and this is what we're going to be exploring. We don't have answers yet, but we're going to spend a few months on this um, with a group we're putting together right now. But his contention is that that is basically deeply problematic because anyone can, you know, on the internet, nobody knows that you're a dog, but, but more accurately on the internet, anybody can claim to be a dog. Uh, and so he says, rather than allowing people to claim identities, they should just introduce themselves in a way where you can you can name them in the moment. And so figuring out the right user experience and workflows around that will mm -hmm. let us build trust. So the idea is that the group doesn't say like, oh, this is fission. Boris says, this key here represents fission. And then I accept it and say, yes, that's the fission group. And that the group itself doesn't have a name associated with it in the metadata. And so no one can spoof it and present me a new alternate group it's like, yeah, yeah, send me your like secret business plans for world domination to the fission group. Here's the fission group. Because then I would be like, I don't know what the group this is. I've never seen this before. It doesn't come from someone. Before. I think related, the two things that I think of that are related to this. So one is uh, out in the wild, uh, there's status.in. Um, so they're an Ethereum based system uh, that does messaging. Uh, so it's a chat client on mobile that you can download this live today. Um, um, and they use a thing where, where, um, yeah, labels essentially happen completely out of band where, um, you know, they generate much like we generate subdomains that they just generate a name and you have to out of band be like, oh, okay, this is, you know, uh, benevolent old Yeti is actually Boris. Yeah. Um, so, and then the second piece being is the work that um, the Matrix team is doing on decentralized reputation. Um, so there's also maybe something like, I've got a 90% confidence in, uh, interval that this is in fact Boris. <laughs> cool. Yeah, these are interesting problems. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll continue to do the work on our end and, and share it with, with everybody else. Amazing. Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty, um, uh, I'm, I'm very interested in that. Uh, we already have, so sort of like the 99% of the, the system that we have is uh, totally, you know, not human readable named. Right, we only introduce like a, a username concept at the topmost layer, and everything below that is just uh, keys, right, and and DIDs. Um, so there's really nothing stopping somebody from having multiple users na usernames, or on a federated system having you know the same uh, maintaining the same file system or the same resources at multiple different names. It's actually yeah. Fine, technically, but then like, well, how do you do the coordination? I don't mean mechanically, like how do I, um, yeah. right? What, so what's you, the user experience? With, what's the and, user and experience? Th this is the big puzzle. And so Cade has kind of provided this provocation. He's a security researcher. He used to be at Spider Oak back in the day and all these kinds of things. And, you know, he writes all these critiques about our, our peer to peer systems and how we're mm -hmm. making these, repeating these mistakes. And so I was kind of like, well, we better put up or shut up. So we're going to go try and figure out whether this works. But his whole case is you can't let people present names to other people in your identity system. That is actually the problem. That's the original sin is that people offer you the name. And if you can't mm -hmm. offer a name, then you can't spoof the name. People name identities that are offered to them anonymously. And then you give a pet name to it and that can't be spoofed or, or interceded on because the other the identity doesn't know what its name's supposed to be. Now, can you do that in a way that doesn't suck to use is the real question. Because uh, obviously nobody wants to live in a world of like, yeah, I have 17 friends and they're all totally opaque crypto hash DIDs. Yep. 
I will say as one tiny piece of evidence, this might not be a totally bad idea. Um, there are a couple of interesting systems of prior art out there. One is actually the Steam friends list. Because Steam's friends list, everybody has named some stupid thing that they you know, chose for a Steam ID you know, 25 years ago or whatever. Everybody, no one on my Steam friends list is their Steam account name. They're just the name of the actual person. Uh, so, and there's a little star next to it showing that that's the name you gave them. So it'd be hard for somebody to spoof that because I gave them that name and it'll be meaningful to me. And similarly, I think Matrix Boris, uh, was it Blaine telling me about this? And that when someone offers you a name, it has, it's grayed out and has a little star next to it indicating that it's their offered name and not a name that you trust. And you have to choose to trust that name before it looks like the other names in the system. Yeah, there's so much of this stuff where, I mean, um, where also it comes down to like default clients. So even when we say matrix, it's like, well, yes. in the element thing, um, yes. Dima, who's on here, um, um, is active in various activity pub and Fediverse things. And all of those things are also kind of similarly, like depends on where you put that stuff. Um, yeah, so um, uh Matrix has a lot of building blocks that are worth looking at. I, I like actually also they have um, community flair, Peter, which is worth looking at. Mm, um, uh, like literally that concept of you can choose for a group or a room, like technically identity is actually a room. And so a like uh, a chat between two people is just a, a room and that's that same atom. Um, but you know, how much of these things do we map to things that people actually understand today? Yeah, this Discord's like allowing you to rename yourself in different yes. contexts. This is yeah. another good uh, example. Yeah, per server, right? Uh, yeah, I really like that one too, right? Where it may, and, and it specifically, it's the, like you were saying, and the Steam thing, it's the 2020s problem of, yeah, all the centralized usernames are now taken. It's unfair to make someone be uh, uh, Brooklyn, uh um 1987 exactly correct <laughs> close so close so close uh <laughs> yeah amazing uh other questions jury you have you have a hand up so sorry uh just two things uh, i i very much agree with peter about many things but the I, I looked at two use cases which which sort of came up in the in, in as i was working one is that I have uh, 16 fission accounts in, in many, many profiles across my machines, and I would like to be able to trust them and get all their data. Now, so I figured that one out. And then I, I moved to the next stage, which is uh, I wanted to build in a little analytics into, into my app. And I figured that if you, you can just give an, give a, give an, give a, give a, a automatically generated username, whoever comes to you, could be just the, the, the exact second when he signed in, chances of, you know, and, and basically I like this idea that, that, that based on trust, so that you, offline or, or out of bounds, you, you, can, you can verify with each other as people, yes, I'm you, I'm whatever, whatever name or whatever is my official name, and then, then really looking at uh, two things that I think I think would be interesting is that uh, I have an alternative approach, which is which I really would like some feedback on. One is that uh, I would like to make this is sort of objective. Would like to be make the granting of access completely dynamic. So it could be out of bounds when we did, we did, we did, you know it, it may, but but basically I would like like that to be out of, out of bounds sort of. Uh, uh, on demand or and and dynamics, so not not tied to resource, but tied to the person requesting the resource, and then whenever a request to a resource comes, I should be able to say, well, yes, I can give it to, to you or not. And the motivation behind that is really is the is the poly poly idea that instead of uh, instead of uh, people hosting your private database so that they can run some algorithm for it on it on your behalf. It would be nice to do the other way around. That that uh, uh, any I should I should be able to let anybody run an algorithm that I trust on all my data, and just share with them the result of the computation. Okay, 
So that, that I mean, these are just alternative use or, the, or additional use cases that I, I'm interested in, and I wonder if anybody interested in these. Yeah. Yeah. So the uh, um, compute bit is actually kind of where this whole thing started, yeah. but that's yeah. There's yeah. a lot yeah. to build before we get there. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then you also run to the problem though we have like partial solutions that we've thought about um, not recently you know, way back when, um, around, well, how do you trust the compute computation was done correctly? So there's there's a bunch of stuff in there, but that is like way out of scope for what we're going to be doing. No, 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 I, I meant, 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 meant it much more simpler. It's basically, whenever I trust, uh, I give access to a web native app to access my database, I'm doing that. They, they actually do some computation in my browser with my data and save the results in, 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 in a dedicated part. So it's, I'm not talking about anything beyond that. So I'm not talking about right. that, but anything that, 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 that possibly even open source or possibly so, good. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, the, so the system as it's designed today supports that. Yeah. We haven't exposed it as an API, but you can do that today. Yes, I know, not, I know, not, I know, yeah. So, so there's a couple things. Um, some early users have um, many accounts, and that is a bug, not a feature. Uh, generally, from a usability perspective, the way that we think about it, and you know, as developers, I think there's a whole piece of, oh, I need some other accounts for testing to to like make sure that it works the way that I think it does. So I totally get that. Um, like literally, our own team um, uh, deals with that a ton. Um, uh, we recently had some interesting things where. Um, uh, we realized the advantages of the system. Uh, so Philip, who's not on right now, um, uh, actually linked uh, his account to Brooke. So she could um, see like, okay, what's it like? What, can I troubleshoot differently on my browser and my machine, you know, using this account? Um, a, ideally, we think of this, certainly the Fission instance platform that we run for usability and end users and so on. Um, that typically users will only have one account. We haven't flipped the switch yet on this as well, but it uh, roughly also is um, a uh, single email address as well. So yeah. the mental model I have of this is Apple's iCloud system. No, you no, no. Mostly... I, I, sorry, sorry, sorry. I'm, I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is that, the, that I'm tra just trying to simulate the, the situation when somebody else is using another account and we're trying to, to exchange uh, information and that that, 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 that uh, authorization could be dynamic. That's all I'm saying. I don't know what dynamic means because that's literally what we're doing today. Um, and that's what this whole presentation was no, about, that it, yeah, okay. that, it will be, that it will be dynamic and that's how we're going to No, 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 sorry. I, I meant the dynamic is that, that, that instead of uh, you granting access to a part of the tree, the people, people can, can ask you for some part and then you 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 respond whether whether you want to get got it. Yeah, that's what I asking, meant by dynamic. Asking for permission. So, right? you, so yeah, that's what I mean. Yeah. So yeah. so that's a higher level thing, and those are some of the UI things of 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 how we do that. So for instance, if you're both online, then much like device linking, uh, mm -hmm. there might be a request in there. Again, we have to worry about things like phishing and other things like that of exactly how that will work. Um, it might also just work because you don't know if the other person is online or offline uh, that you, but you know their username. So, so let's assume that there's some knowledge in here, yeah, right? You yeah, either yeah, know their email assumption. address yes. or you know their username. Let's, let's say those are the two. Both of those things are things that the fission stuff, uh, the fission system knows about. Um, you could also just know their subdomain, but ultimately those are kind of the same thing. Yeah. Um, um, and then that person says, hey, can I get access? Yeah. Um, um, and then out of band would be some of that approval on, on how that stuff happens, right? So um, yes, that's, that okay, will need okay. to be built into the system rel relatively simply. So again, th think of exactly how you want to build those things and we have the primitives for that. Yeah, okay, thank you. Uh, other questions? This was a pretty deep dive. So um, if you if you 
don't have a picture of, of uh, the web native file system in your head, it might have been uh, um, a bit much. I actually uh, will take all of these comments and links and link back to the presentation that uh, Brooke and Daniel did. I think that's going all the way back to last November now when we did the full uh, WinFS overview. Um, ultimately, this is very much under the covers of how it works at Fission. Mental model is kind of like an iCloud account um, that we're assuming and have built this in a way that it's very, very secure. So it means that we can do things like put a keychain into it and do other sharing with that. Um, we're pretty excited about this and lots of people want to get to, you know, shared private stuff. And this also is some of the building blocks for um, you know, we talk about files, but these are the same building blocks for uh, database like structures, right, Brooke? Yeah, exactly. Um, it's uh, all, all these things are uh, prerequisites. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So this is on the roadmap. We will have multi user shared private files, um, you know, and there's another layer above this as well of like, oh, I want to use this, I want to make this work in real time or uh, for various chat use cases and so on, but we have to build the basic use cases of shared um, and then we can do things um, uh, which then can be asynchronous and online or, or offline. And then of course will be the use case as Brooke showed at the very beginning of the stack of uh, online at the same time and stuff that feels more real timey, right? <laughs> There's an entire real-time section. <laughs> so this stuff is all decidedly not real-time because it's async. Exactly. Awesome. Uh, thank you, Brooke. I'm going to stop the recording button now.